Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm very excited to have Anthony Anarino joining us. Anthony, welcome. Welcome back, you mean, right? We've done this a couple of times. See, you're already spoiling it. That's what I was going <laughs> to get to next, Anthony. Uh, you're right. So this is our second podcast. I'm really glad. I'm honored to have you back. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be back. So for those who haven't listened to the first episode or kind of instance of us having a conversation on the podcast earlier and just might not know much about you and your world yet, take a moment to share what you do. I'm a speaker and I'm a coach and a consultant and a business owner and an entrepreneur. And I would probably sum it up by saying a teacher, but I'm also a writer. So I've written three books in the last three years and I've kept a blog at thesalesblog.com for now nine years where I published every day minus 13 days when I went to Tibet in 2010, only because I didn't think I was going to have Wi-Fi. But it turns out Wi-Fi, even in Tibet, because of China Mobile, is exceptionally good. And I could have done it from there, but I didn't know that when I left. So that's what I do. Anthony, that's no excuse. 13 <laughs> days. Come on. It's, uh... 13 days. I could clean that up easy. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting when you just kind of, the way you describe yourself, one thing really resonated with me there for a moment when you said that you call yourself or describe yourself as a teacher. I've felt the same way over the years. Like I never would have thought that I would describe myself as a teacher and I still don't maybe outwardly, but inwardly. What I've noticed about myself is that's really where I get the most joy is when I'm helping and working with others. Many years ago, my mother said to me, she's like, you should be a teacher. You'd be really good at that. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to teach. I want to make money. I want to build businesses. Right. But I've just like realized over the last few years at the core, that's really what resonates with me the most. And that's where my passion is, is teaching. So just nice to hear you say that. If you're a leader and if you're a consultant, if you're a writer, what you're engaged in is teaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what you're engaged in at some level, even if it's just teaching someone to have an awareness of something that they're unaware of, a problem or a deficiency or an opportunity. So yeah, I think a teacher is a good word. Yeah. All right. So when you and I first spoke or you came on the podcast here several years ago, you already had a, a very successful staffing and recruitment business. You were well established as a sales coach and a consultant. But the reason I wanted to really have you back on the show is because over the last few years, I've watched your brand grow significantly. And I don't know, you know, numbers wise, what that exactly means, but I just, I see you a lot more than I did before. And it just seems like your brand has been adopted and accepted. And there's a lot more going on. What happened, Anthony? It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting question that I've thought about this because you think something like, well, when this event happens and I get 50,000 views on the blog a month, then everything's really going to start happening. I mean, it's better, but there's no real change in your day-to-day life and it just Mm -hmm. continues to go on. And then you think, well, when the first book comes out, that's going to be the launching point. And the first book did great. It's USA Today bestseller. And we sold 12,000 copies the first week. And that's a, a huge accomplishment. I worked really hard to sell that many books. But I mean, it adds, but your life doesn't change dramatically. And then you think, well, the second book, 10 months later, two books, who does that? That's hard to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got a lot of attention. And you don't really notice that the perception changes. And you know, the third book came out November 6th, so a few months ago. And you think, well, this is going to be it. And in a lot of ways, that book did really, really well because I don't think people expected this book from me. But then when they read it, they were, again, surprised like they were in the last couple of books as to what's inside the book. And you think, well, that's going to do it. And there really isn't one thing. I think that what happens is the more you work at it, the more people know who you are. And the more you try to just go into the world and create value for other people, by sharing ideas with them and you're not charging a toll for them to get the ideas. They can come out and read your blog and watch your YouTube videos and these things. More people start to become aware of you and then more people start to share things and you don't know that it's happening. And I didn't know it was happening, but I have hundreds of people that tell me, oh yeah, my sales manager uses your Sunday newsletter for his Monday morning meeting. Well, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that sales trainers use my YouTube videos to train salespeople, but they're getting introduced to me by other people. 
because the content is there and it's the right ideas for the right time for those people anyway. And it gets shared. And so you start to have more and more awareness of who you are and what you do. And I also think that I'm a different voice than many in my particular world because the sales world where I live, people are really hyped up about digital. They're really hyped up about social selling. They're really hyped up about LinkedIn. And I just believe that the way to determine what the future is going to look like is not to try to predict the future, but to look backwards and don't look for what's new, but look for what's been sustained over long periods of time. And I continue to argue that digital is not interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. One, the phone is an interesting piece of equipment, but it didn't make anybody a better salesperson. It made them maybe more efficient, but it didn't make them better. And the things that make somebody a trusted advisor are the same things that made someone a trusted advisor for the pharaoh or for the king or for Caesar. It was, do you have insight? Do you have situational knowledge or the type of experiences that allow you to say, based on what we're looking at, this fact pattern, this is probably the best choice of action of these two or three choices that you could choose from. And that hasn't changed. So character hasn't changed. Values haven't changed. Presence hasn't changed. Being somebody who actually has the ability to come in and give you the answer to difficult situations, that's still really, really important. And digital hasn't changed that. What would you say for the consultants listening to this right now who they're already doing well? Like they're at a place maybe similar to where you were years ago when we had you on that first podcast episode or somewhere, you know, around kind of the same level in terms of how they might judge their own success, but they want to elevate their brand and they want to get to that next level of success. I mean, you shared that, you know, you've been writing daily on your blog, you've put out three books, you've worked really hard at them. But if you had to give me one piece of advice for someone who wants to take their brand to the next level to make a, a greater impact and ultimately to build their business, what would you tell them? Yeah, and let's go back to digital for just a minute. And I will say I'm fascinated right now by an ex-Navy SEAL who's an ultra athlete named David Goggins. And if you're not paying attention to David Goggins, he's got a new book out called Can't Hurt Me. And it's worth watching his interview with Joe Rogan on Joe Rogan's podcast. You can watch it on YouTube. Just search David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S. And I'm reading his book and I'm somewhere, it's maybe a 330 page book or something like that. And I'm maybe halfway through, a little bit past halfway, where he asks himself a question. He just finishes an ultra event that he shouldn't have been able to finish in the first place. It was a marathon after having run 100 miles a week before and he was broken, but he still did it. And the question he asked himself is, what am I capable of? Mm. What am I capable of? And that's such a powerful question because I believe everyone has greater potential to make a difference. And no human being, as far as I can tell, has ever reached their full potential. And I imagine if Da Vinci had two more years or Michelangelo had two more years or Einstein would have had two more years, they would have probably told you, yeah, I'm really going to use this time that I have left to try to create the best outcome I can and to try to make the biggest contribution I can. So I don't look at this as a brand building exercise like some do, like I really want to be a brand. I look at it from what are you trying to do? How are you trying to make a difference in the world? Who are you trying to help? If they can't find you, if they don't know what you stand for, if they don't know how you help them, then you're depriving somebody of a potential way to help them produce better results. So the reason that you do all this work, and this is where digital is really handy, especially for people in our category, it's really handy because the thing that someone needs to know is, do you understand my problem? Do you have ideas about my problem? Do you have experience helping people with the thing that I'm challenged with right now? And if you're what I call a secret agent, if no one knows what you do, mm -hmm. then they can't reach out to you and they can't discover you and have an awareness of who you are and what you do, even though they need your help right now. So where I don't think digital has changed, the thing about us that is most important is, do you have the competencies? And anybody that would take the time to listen to a podcast like this, they have that. There's no question about that. But can they find you? Can you make it easy for them to say, wait a second, this person sounds like they understand the challenge and we should probably reach out and have a conversation with them or start signing up to get their information so we can take a deeper dive into knowing who they are and see if they're a fit. But you have to go out and do marketing. 
I don't know if we had this on our last conversation, but I think a lot of people in our space, consultants generally think, I'm really good at the consulting part. I'm just not really good at acquiring customers. Mm -hmm. Well, you have the tools. And this would be like somebody saying to you, listen, you can advertise on NBC, CBS, and ABC for free. All you have to do is develop the content and we're going to run it for you. That would be amazing if that happened in 1982. But right now you can go out onto Facebook and start publishing content for people. You can go out on Instagram. You can go to YouTube for sure. And you can write a blog and all of this is going to be indexed by Google. And when people search, you're going to have information and answers for those people. And you have a group of people working hard to put that information in front of the people that need it. So as much as I'm opposed to Facebook as it pertains to privacy and what I'll call, we know what IQ is and mm -hmm. you know what EQ is. So I'll add MQ, moral quotient. Mm -hmm. They have a very low MQ at the leadership positions right now. And Google may too. You know, I think that they put money above people. They have nice sayings like we're here to build communities and bring people together so we can sell their data to other people or right. we don't want to do any evil. But the fact of the matter is we're going to turn your data over to people that we like. So there's that going on right now. But Anthony, what, what would you say that to the people though who say, yeah, I understand that, but they've hesitated to put content out because they're concerned that they might not be the right content or they don't know where to start or they're just, they're finding reasons not to put out that content, even though they might deep down inside recognize that it is an opportunity. There's something stopping them from doing that. Like for you, where does the commitment come from? You know, you said it's not just about building a brand. It's about making sure that you're getting out there. Like this is a much bigger vision for you, a more a long-term kind of mindset and approach. What's driving you to put out all this content, to write all these books, to get up every day and write the blog post, which I think if you still do the same way before, it was like you'd get up, you'd go make your coffee and you'd, you'd hit the keyboard. Like what is the driving force and where is that commitment coming from in your case? Well, we started there. I'm a teacher and I'm here to help people transform mm. in areas of their life where I have the experience and the ability to do that. And I get up and I do that because that's what makes me happy is helping other people. You know, when I was teaching a college class, undergrads would tell me, I want to work in a nonprofit when I get out of here. And I would say, why are you so selfish? And they'd say, no, I said, I want to work for a nonprofit. I'm like, well, why do you want to work for a nonprofit? Because I want to help people. Well, how do you feel when you help people? I feel great when I help people. See how selfish you are? You won't take a job unless it makes you feel good. And they would laugh, but there's a truth to that. You know, it feels good to help other people. I saw the research at Christmas this year that basically said the satisfaction people get from giving is far greater than the satisfaction they get from getting the gift. And I believe that's true. And I think that when you look in the United States at a life expectancy that's declining. And mm -hmm. it's declining for two reasons, suicide and overdoses of heroin or opiate-based drugs. That's because people don't have purpose and meaning, and they think somehow that that purpose and meaning is external, when in fact, it's a decision you make for yourself. Where do you want to invest your time? Where do you want to invest your energy? Where do you want to invest your psychic energy and your emotional energy? Where do you want to do that work? And if you don't have that purpose and meaning, then I don't think that you're really motivated because the word motivate means you have a motive. So what is that motive? Mine is to help other people produce better results. And it's what I know my calling is. So that's where I spend my time working because it's where I do the work that helps others and makes me fulfilled. So I would tell you there's only one thing that stops you from doing this work. Well, there's two maybe. One, you don't have clarity of purpose. The second is fear. Mm -hmm. What if it's the wrong content? What if somebody judges me? What if someone doesn't hire me because they didn't like my take on this? What if somebody criticizes me? And there's a, all the what ifs, but it's always fear that's behind the reason to not go all in and do something like that. It's some fear that's stopping them. And I can promise you, when you have enough attention, you will have people that don't like you and will say something. I have a my favorite review on Ether Lunch says, nothing new here, same old B2B fluff, supported by people who want you to know how good of a salesperson they are. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And I love it because the book has all kinds of things that aren't new. 
but something about me makes this person feel something about themselves. And what they feel about themselves is not good. And I bring that out in them. I don't mean to bring it out in them. It's not my intention to bring it out in them. But there's nothing I can do about it. You're going to bring that out in somebody. Somebody's going to say, no, that's exactly the wrong idea. They should be doing it exactly the other way. And maybe that's their experience and maybe that's their truth. But you can't let that stop you from living your truth and sharing your truth with people who need it because the people who need it are going to find you and they are going to engage with you and you are going to help them. Yeah, it's a great message. Thanks for sharing that, Anthony. You know, you talked about this idea of being a trusted advisor and being able to really provide ideas or counsel to, to those that you want to serve. Where do you go to, to gain your insights or what do you suggest that a consultant who wants to stay at the top of their game, like what should they be doing on a regular basis to ensure that they can like stay as sharp as possible and really have the opportunity to play that role of a trusted advisor? While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step -step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. Well, one thing I would tell you is that you probably have to be a lateral thinker. And I think that what you're going to have to do to do that is you're going to have to really broaden, you know, there's the fox and the hedgehog. When you look at people who make predictions about the future, foxes who are sort of wide in their knowledge always beat hedgehogs because hedgehogs are sort of narrow focused. I know this area. I know economics. Yeah, but do you know sociology? Mm -hmm. No, I don't know sociology. Yeah, but do you know technology? No, I don't really know technology. Well, those things aren't separate from each other. They all exist in uh, this reality that we occupy. So you have to be broader than that. I would tell you while we're talking, I'm pulling up my December reading list. My December reading list started with Human Evolution, Our Brains and Behavior by Robert Dunbar, the guy famous for Dunbar's number, which says you can manage something close to 150 relationships, and some people can get up to 225. Mm -hmm. An interesting book. And I followed that book up with The Hope Circuit, which is Marty Seligman, who created Positive Psychology's biography. And it's a deep, deep dive into the difference between the behaviorists and the cognitive people in psychology and how that came to happen. And I followed that up with Gridiron Genius, a masterclass in winning championships and building dynasties in the NFL. And I probably have 30 bookmarks in that book of just things that are practical and tactical that you could immediately apply helping a customer in a bunch of different areas, including even managing the clock. Oddly enough, in my world in sales, it turns out managing the clock and how much of your client's time you get is a metric that's worth thinking about. Atomic Habits, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results by James Clear, who's a, a local guy. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a terrific book everyone should read. And, and then Steal My Soldier's Heart by Colonel Hackworth, who's the most decorated soldier in U.S. history, joined the army to fight in World War II when he was 15. And this is how he turned around the worst group in Vietnam. And then Bedtime Stories by Managers by a Canadian, Henry Mintzberg. And it's a wonderful collection of 100 blogs. I interviewed him for my podcast. It's a breadth. It's not right. like I'm not just reading sales books and I'm not just reading marketing books and books on customer acquisition. There's all these lessons that you can mm -hmm. pick up and apply. So you need to be broader than that. So you have a deeper understanding. 
I've heard this from many wise people over the years. I remember way back in the day hearing Jay Abraham talk about, you know, the importance of and just the opportunities, the breakthroughs that can happen by applying something that works really well in one industry to a different industry that has never had, you know, that approach in it before. And, and I can see the value. And I've just firsthand experience also, you know, seen what you're talking about play out here. So I think that's really great advice. We're talking about a lot of books. Like you just gave a, a big reading list for people. But I want to talk about your books for just a moment. You have three best selling books. The first is The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need. The second, The Lost Art of Closing. And the third that recently came out, which is Eat Their Lunch. Now, writing a book is one thing, but turning that book into a successful tool or just a tool that helps you to create a bigger platform or reach your goals is a whole other thing. You mentioned that with one of your books, right, you got 12,000 plus copies sold in the first week or so. In your experience of publishing and promoting and launching these three books, what is you know maybe the biggest one or two things that people should keep in mind if they want to have a successful book launch? Not just writing the book, but actually making sure that the book reaches enough of the right kinds of people. You're going to have to work really hard for that to happen. So the first thing that I would tell you is this is a team sport. It's 100% a team sport. Elaborate on that. What do you mean? If you don't have 50 friends that are in the community that you have willing to email their list on your behalf and willing to read the book for you and give you thoughts and write a review for you and share it with their peers, you're not going to be able to do very well unless you already have a really big brand. But the difficulty is, can you reach enough people? So you really want to start making friends long before you publish a book. The second thing you have to know is almost no one reads a book. So I know so many people who are afraid of like, well, I have my whole framework in here and this is my IP. Okay, it's copywritten, number one, trademark it if you want to. But if people can't see something, they're not going to buy it. So they have to be able to see enough of it to know what that is. And where I did the right thing, and I would love to tell you I'm, I'm prescient. I do like to study the future, but it, this is just luck. Mm -hmm. I found my way into a group very early on. And I decided not to publish the book for a long time while I built a big enough audience to sell a book to. So I worked on just building the audience, continuing to nurture them, building a newsletter list, and then building all the friends so I could do that. A lot of the reason people get this backwards is they think, well, when I have the book, then I'll have the audience. No, first you have the audience and then you have the book. That's what's changed. The world is now so fragmented. There's never going to be another Led Zeppelin there's never going to be another ACDC. There's never going to be another pick your favorite television show from 10 years or 15 years ago. There's probably never going to be another Seinfeld because we're not all confined to three channels or three music channels. There's so much fragmentation out there. You have to work really, really hard to overcome that and build a community. But if you have friends and they're willing to share you with their community and you're willing to share them with your community, then you start to get this synergy that you can't get on your own. You need other people that are willing to help you. Where does this mindset come from, Anthony? Because I've seen more and more people, not a lot, but just people who are really at the top of their game. And so I'm very interested in like where this mindset comes from for you. And, and even the ability, I think with so many people who are trying to have instant gratification and short-term thinking, want the result right now, you know, you're doing the exact opposite. You're front loading, you're depositing as much as you possibly can into like that relationship and value bank before you try and take a withdrawal. Is this just from your own experience? Is it, you know, reading and studying? Where and how did you get to the point where you feel comfortable and confident with putting out a lot of value, investing a lot in relationships before you try and transact, which is I think what, you know, the opposite of what a lot of people do? I've spent a lot of time working on eliminating debilitating infections of the mind, like scarcity. Mm. The reason that I don't want to share my audience with you is that they might like you better than me and then they're going to hire you and not me. That's scarcity thinking. The fact of the matter is the fact that you pointed to me and you said Anthony's worth bringing on. First off, that's a gift to me, so thank you. But it also means I'm the trusted advisor because I'm telling you this person is worth paying attention to. So I'm now sitting in that spot. But I have an abundance mindset. And I do a conference with three of my friends and I was on the book launch. We did an event in Chicago and one of the first questions asked me was, why do you promote Jeb Blunt and Mike Weinberg and Mark Hunter's work 
and they're your competitors. I mean, you actually do the same thing in the same world with the same kind of companies. And I said, because there's enough to go around. There's not a scarcity. There's an abundance. And if you believe that there's scarcity, the world will look like scarcity for you, for sure. But if you believe that the world is abundance and you go out and try to make a difference for other people, even people, you know, these guys do the same thing I do. There's no question about it. We trade each other work all the time. I can't take this date. Can you take it? And we trade work back and forth because there is an abundance out there, but only for the people that believe that and act as if. So you have to act as if there is abundance. There's not scarcity. And if there's scarcity, then go back to where we were a few minutes ago and decide, are you putting enough out that you should expect people to know who you are and come to you? Mm. And that's a decision. Yeah, love it. Anthony, clearly you're a sales expert. You know, you've written the book. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you maybe just a couple of real quick specific sales questions. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. All right. So in your book, The Lost Art of Closing, you have a quote that says something along the lines of, selling isn't something you do to someone. It is something you do for someone and with someone. Is that about right? That's exactly right. Okay. I love that mindset because I think the first part is like what holds so many people back. They're trying to transact. They're trying to sell to people. They're always going with the mindset of, I need to sell. That's how they've been trained. That's just kind of what they know. And you're saying it's the exact opposite, right? It's figure out how you can do something for someone and with someone more collaboratively. Share just me a little bit more for everyone listening right now, like what you really mean by this and maybe just the opportunity for those that truly embrace this mindset. In a sales interaction, your intention is to win the sale. There's no doubt that that's your intention. The question is, how do you do it? Do you do it in a way that's self-oriented where you're saying, I need you to do this and this is what I want? Or do you say, what does this person in front of me need right now? Are they satisfied with the status quo and they really need an awareness of how different the results that they're capable of are from what I'm looking at right here? Do they really need to understand what their choices are about how to think about this problem and how to make some decisions and what kind of trade-offs they should be thinking about? Do they really need to evaluate their options? Do they really need to bring in the rest of their team to get engaged in this so they know what their company is actually possible of? And do they need help managing that? And if you start asking yourself a different set of questions, like what does this person need? What does this person need help with? How do I help them? Mm -hmm. And if you decide I'm going to try to serve them in this interaction, in this interaction, I'm not going to get them to sign something in this interaction. I'm going to serve them in this interaction. Everything after that just gets easier and easier because you're not concerned about winning the deal. The way that you win a deal is not trying to win the deal, but trying to serve them and create a preference where they say, man, I want to work with Michael. Why? Because he's smart. I wasn't even aware of these things. He's got the right kind of experience. He shared with us what these trade-offs were. We weren't even thinking about it. That's how you create a preference and a desire to work with you. You give people the experience. What's it going to be like to work with you? And if the whole thing is about the transaction, then that's what they can expect in the future. And then they think, well, that's not really what I want in the future. What I really want is somebody who understands me. And you know, if you go to my friend Charlie Green and you ask him about trust, he'll tell you it's reliability times credibility times intimacy divided by your self-orientation. And if you ask him which of those three, reliability, credibility, or intimacy, has the greatest impact on whether or not somebody trusts you, it's intimacy. And that's, do you know me? Do you understand me? Do you understand what I'm trying to do? Do you care about me? That's the part that you have to focus on. If you get that part right, everything else is easier. Your latest book, Eat Their Lunch, is all about how to, or kind of looks at, you know, how to take away business from the competition, which might sound harsh to some people, but that's really what we're about is, you know, growing business and looking at how to capture more market share in many cases. So for the independent consultants or the small consulting firm owner, Anthony, who's listening to this, what would be, you know, your best advice or a couple of ideas that they should start thinking about or, or considerations they should have to win business away from maybe larger, more established consulting firms they sometimes find themselves coming up against? My best advice, especially for small firms, is you actually have an enormous advantage over a big firm, even though it doesn't feel like that, and even if you don't know it yet. But I'll share the secret with you because this is how it really works. If you want large industrial, we already have a slide deck worked out. We're going to charge you millions of dollars for the same slide deck we gave to your competitor. And by the way, 
our slide deck looks a lot like BCG's and it looks like Bain's and it looks like everybody else's because we've all been benchmarking and you're going to get a little bit of attention and a lot of stuff that's been manufactured for somebody else. Definitely you want to go with a big firm. But if you want high trust, high value, high caring, the reason that people choose a boutique to do this work is because it's somebody who's going to be intimate, who's going to understand your needs, who's going to be able to work with your team and is going to be here to help you actually execute this work and generate the better outcomes that you're looking for. And that's your advantage. And what happens is we think that we have to be all buttoned up and we're going to go and compete with the McKinsey. You don't even need to worry about McKinsey. If you show up and say, if you want somebody who's going to be here and do this work for you and have a presence and get to know your people and spend time here, I might be a better choice for you. And I'd love to explore that. And that's the conversation. But if you even use the words that I use, you can say, in comparison to the big firms, there's no comparison. They're much bigger with many, many more people. But if high trust, high value, high caring, and actually generating the outcomes important to you, I'd love to ask you for an opportunity to compete for your business. You can just be that straightforward about it because it is your advantage. They can't be boutique. They're too big to be boutique. They're too big to care. They're a machine. They have to, they're a well-oiled machine, by the way, but they're a machine. So they have to keep that thing churning all the time. And to do that, that means they don't have time to do some of the work that a boutique can do. And that's the work, that part about the caring and the intimacy, that's where you're going to win. I'm telling you that from personal experience. Well, I was going to say, you know, that that just rolled off your tongue beautifully. It sounds like you've stated those words more than once before. Almost everything I've said, (laughs) I say over and over again. (laughs) Listen, when we punish my children, I don't take their car away from them. I just say, we're just going to sit and talk until we resolve this. And they're like, no, please just take my car. <laughs> uh, Anthony, this has been great. I really want to thank you again for coming on. I want to also make sure that people can learn more about you and your work. We've talked about, you mentioned your blog and the three books, but just go ahead, share me the, the URL, the best place that people should go to learn more about you. Best place is thesalesblog.com. And if you want more of the kind of things that we talked about, you sign up for the Sunday newsletter. And there's a thesalesblog.com forward slash newsletter. That'll get you there. Perfect. We'll make sure to have all that linked up in the show notes. Anthony, again, thanks so much. As always, a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, Learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com.